Hi, I'm Rick Birkenstock, and I've been in technology my whole career. I uh, got started in you know, Bitcoin and digital assets back in 2013, um, and I've been very passionate about the space ever since. And uh, as, um, as an advisor to the project that we're going to be talking about uh, in some good detail today. And today I'm here with Price Givens. Uh, Price is somebody I've known for just about 20 years now, in fact. Uh, but, you know, what's interesting about Price is he, his first uh, software company was founded in 1993. And he began building cryptocurrency businesses uh, as far back as 2013. And a couple of those are actually today currently servicing millions of users. Um, some of the other, some of those properties include Bitcoin Wallet, uh, FiatLeak.com, uh, as well as um, a couple that we're here to talk about today, Milix and uh, Tangled, and we'll get a little, uh, into those in a little bit more detail. Uh, but since we're here, and Price, I, I know you, but the audience doesn't, so maybe you could give a little bit more uh, color commentary on you know, kind of how you started in in the uh, cryptocurrency business, and you know, talk us, um, bring us up to to date with current current day, and we'll talk some more about the the projects that are happening right now. Yeah, it's good to be here, Rick. Um, my story is like most people's story. the The first time I heard about Bitcoin, I which was in 2011, I dismissed it, of course, like everyone generally did the first time they hear about it. And I suppose I, I thought that it was kind of an upgrade from World of Warcraft Gold, but I, I, didn't, I didn't understand it. But the things that, that I came to, to understand that, that Bitcoin solved were, were already perspectives and, and problems that I had run into personally. And so I was a really adoptive ear to the idea of Bitcoin when I finally kind of got it. And um, I, I kind of YOLO'd into Bitcoin um, in 2013. And not long after that, I, I YOLO'd my life into Bitcoin. I, I started to mine in 2013 um, using the same rigs that you have on your desk there, the Butterfly Labs units. And yeah, this is your fault, by the way. Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's easy to understand. <laughs> so. I'll take yeah. the blame. Um, I, <laughs> yeah. you know, it didn't. It didn't take long mining Bitcoin to to kind of kind of the conclusion that um, mining Bitcoin isn't really much about mining Bitcoin. It's it's more about the logistics of securing the hottest mining gear ahead of the rest of the market using it as hard as you can while it's relevant and then just at the at the twilight of its irrelevancy selling it off on ebay to someone else and hopefully replacing it with a unit that you had ordered months before and and never quite making enough money from the mining activity to justify selling the underlying asset bitcoin in order to buy the rig in the first place and that probably uh, I guess I guess we'll kind of talk about that my my poor experience in mining later when we talk about kind of efficiency of of running a cryptocurrency. And it it wasn't it wasn't long after um, I stopped mining that I you know I I have a kind of an entrepreneurial drive and so I, I wanted to do more than just hold the Bitcoin that I had and and watch it go up so I used. I used some of the Bitcoin that I had to buy two things in 2014. The first thing that I bought was the BitcoinWallet.com domain name, which kind of made news because it was a big purchase at the time. It was $250,000 and, and that got everybody in the community excited and, you know, based on the, the way that some people presented that purchase, it, it made it sound like it was Wall Street that was buying it and everybody got excited. <laughs> And the second thing that I bought around that same time was a site called fiatleak.com, which um, I had been a, a fan of and I had been a, a user of, and it had gotten some attention on 
USA Today and, and Kim.com had, had tweeted about it. So it had a little buzz to it. And, um, and so I, I bought that. And, and honestly, I, I bought that to try to um, give myself some credibility in the community, in, in particular in the Reddit community, because it's a, it's a, tough, it's a tough crowd. And, and if, if you want to kind of develop um, business or, or present what you consider to be innovative ideas to the Bitcoin community, at the time, Reddit was the place to do it. And, you know, it was, it was tough to, to say good morning on Reddit without everyone pulling out the machine gun. So, so Fiat Leak was, was kind of, a, of a, an attempt to um, introduce myself to the community with some credibility. All right. Well, thanks a lot for that, Price. Uh, maybe you could uh, talk, you know, talk to me a little bit about, uh, so how did the idea for Millix come about? The, I, the idea for Millix is probably different than kind of the other projects that I'm, I'm aware of, especially at the time. It, it seemed like at the time, crypto projects were, were coming out kind of for their own sake. Um, you know, somebody, so, so Bitcoin had kind of established its, its position as, as a store of value and Ethereum was, was starting to gain traction as, as, you know, computing resource. And then other projects were trying to find niches within, for functionality within crypto, right? So maybe, maybe somebody was trying to figure out storage and someone was trying to figure out, um, you know, using computing resources on the host, the host computers, the, the miners computers. Millix was, um, Millix came about because I had an idea for an ecosystem that I, that I wanted to build um, to, to solve some things that I thought were important. And, and Millix was just a required component of, of the ecosystem. So the kind of the, the feature set of Millix that, that was prioritized in the design stage was meant to facilitate the ecosystem that was coming behind it. So was it an emphasis on speed or, you know, what, what were some of the properties of, that you thought about when you, you considered, okay, I'm going to build this ecosystem. None of the current projects out there are really capable of supporting it. So I need, you know, what, what, where were the deficiencies and what were the priorities then therefore for Millix? Yeah. The priority, the priority set was extremely large scale in terms of, um, storing transaction data and extremely large scale in the number of transactions that could happen on the network per second. And, and, and then from there, the, the focus, this kind of the secondary consideration was to make this thing the, the best, that, to, to make it optimized for micropayments. Payments where um, the amount that, that could be sent are maybe one one hundredth of the size of the size of a fee on every other protocol that was that I had access to see at the time. Yeah, and so what I, I mean, so there were other layer one technologies like you know Bitcoin or proof of work. There's there was proof of stake. There were some layer two technologies that were just emerging. Like I, I think at the time that the Millix project started in correct me if I'm wrong in 2018. Um, you know, Lightning was available, but very much in its infancy. Um, but still, I think, you know, to your point, the questions around throughput and just being able to support, you know, just millions upon millions of micro of microtransactions, you know, really wasn't there. I mean, were there other sort of other layer one technologies that you considered? And, and how did you land on, you know, the underlying technology for Millix, and maybe you could maybe you could uh, explain what that uh, layer one technology is for for Millix and give us an overview on that. Yeah. So when we when we looked at the the layer one technology, um, we kind of we kind of looked at, at two different buckets of, of technology. 
blockchain, um, which was kind of the de facto technology at the time, um, which did not have uh, a great reputation or even prospect for being able to do the speed and the scale for microtransactions that I, I thought I needed to do. And the second, the second bucket of, of layer one tech was the, the DAG, the, the direct acyclic graph. And, and so we, we went in that direction and, and we, we hoped that we'd be able to, to use, um, there, there were a couple currencies at the time, there were two or three, and we hoped that we'd be able to use the, the, the technology that had already been built um, by, by those projects and just kind of stand on the shoulders of giants and, and move the ball a little bit further forward. And um, it, it didn't take long before we, we, you know, when we get under the, under the hood of the other projects, they didn't, they didn't meet exactly all the criteria that was important to, to not just me, but other people on the team. And mm -hmm. some of those would have been um, an absolute pure decentralization. Right? That, was, that was really important to me. And, and at the time, those layer one technologies were there were centralized validators, centralized controllers in order to, to get um, kind of a known state of the network to, to try to simulate the same, the same state of a network that, that a blockchain had already figured out, but maybe wasn't going to be able to scale up in, in, in speed or micro size payments. Right. So you looked at yeah, so you looked at some of these projects. Well, you look first of all, you looked at like, well, blockchain or DAG. Uh, blockchain really, you know, didn't, you know, kind of fell to the side because of you know speed and transactional throughput, those those sorts of uh, considerations. And then when you looked at the DAG projects um, from memory, you know, some of these, uh, they're still out there today, right? But uh, you know, IOTA, Byteball, um, you know, they just were lacking in some of the you know they didn't provide for some of the the things that you were viewing as going to be necessary right for instance um was you know i think in millix there's the concept of um you've included in the millix architecture and the concept of sharding right and i i don't believe that was you know something that was available in in those other projects is that like a good example of something that you know, wasn't uh, present in those other projects that you determined like, hey, we're going to need to store lots of data and we're going to need it to be fully decentralized. And the only way to do that, you know, uh, or one solution for that is is sharding. Yeah, sharding, sharding is a good example. And, and to be fair to those other projects, um, you know, I, I might not have had I might have had a better understanding of exactly what the limitations of those projects were if I was talking to the the guys working on those projects, um, and mm -hmm. and you know this was and it was unfortunate that that we couldn't use one of those projects because um, building building a new project from absolutely scratch, right? We we there's not a single line of code in Millix that can be found in in another cryptocurrency unless somebody got it from Millix and put it in their project. And the Millix code base is, is open source, right? It uh, is. So, yeah. so you're saying that the mill there's no line of code in the Millix code base, but specifically that from any other project, but specifically for the protocol, right? Because I, you know, if you go into the Millix, uh, you know, GitHub repository, you'll see, you know, other other elements from you know the open source community pulled in, right? But the protocol itself is 100% from scratch. Yeah, everything to do with, um, you know, for example, to, to reference one of your examples, um, Node Node.js is a part of of Millix, and obviously we didn't build Node.js. Um, right. But yeah, the, so so sharding sharding is a good example because not only not only did we want to store um, you know, a hundred thousand transactions a second, you know, that, which is a lot, but we also, we also wanted to store essentially any amount of data with each transaction output. 
So a, a 30 second MPEG file, right? That's, that's something that, that and, and sharding, sharding was a known, a known solution um, in 2018. There were people working on that, but like many things at the time, you, you didn't, including lightning, by the way, right? You, you didn't know at the time of all the things thrown up against the wall, what was gonna stick and where you should place your bets. And, and so we, we just placed our bets on, on our, our team and mm -hmm. um, my patients and, and we just carried on. So if I, if I wanna participate in the Millix network, um, how do I do that? If I wanna run a Millix node, you know, am I going to need a significant investment in hardware? Um, like, you know, you know, current currently we hear a lot about like, oh, gee, you know, well, if you want to be a, a full, you know, validating node in Ethereum or Solana, you need a quarter million dollars worth of, you know, you need to invest a quarter million dollars worth of hardware to run a full node. Is what what what's the Millix network like, and what does it take if I want to run a node and participate? Yeah, so let's let's start first with kind of the difference between a blockchain, a, a proof of work blockchain, and and the DAG. In particular, how how we kind of built the DAG. Um, a, a proof of work blockchain um, attracts miners who are essentially. You, if you have 10,000 10, miners working on a particular proof of work blockchain, all of those miners are consuming as much electricity as possible, as fast as possible, with the hope of, of winning a race where there's only one prize. And, and the prize is that you solve the block and you get the, the miner's fee for solving the block. And in, in addition, which is, that's a, that's a game that's hard to, to compete in as an individual. I mean, you're, at this point, you're competing against publicly traded NASDAQ companies who are capitalized, you know, over a billion dollars, and they have tens of thousands of miners, um, which is important. But what's equally important is that they have hundreds of millions of dollars worth of contracts with the producers of the miners for delivering mining equipment well into the future, where an individual is is not going to be able to gain access to whatever the 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 best miner is to compete, because in the case of uh, like Bitcoin, which is a proof of work blockchain, the the difficulty of the task that the miners do increases as more miners come online. Right? It, 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 I'm 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 probably not saying anything that. Everyone watching this doesn't already know, but a, a, a protocol like Bitcoin aims to produce a block every 10 minutes. And re regardless of how many miners are working to solve that block. And if, if more miners come onto the network, uh, the network is going to make the mining work more difficult to get to keep that, that 10 minute hard timeline in place. And I, and I think that that's true of all the proof of work. And mm -hmm. so, so to get involved with Millix, well, bef before that, um, a DAG, such as, such as the one that, that Millix uses, is, is allowing any participant, any node on the network, to send a transaction to another, an, an address, or through other nodes. So, so if, if I send a transaction, it's gonna go from me to another node and then propagate out to all the nodes that are visible to all the nodes it is propagated to. And um, there's, there's, not a, a, there's not a centralized coordinated task that anybody's working on like they are with a proof of work blockchain. Each transaction that's, that's sent through a DAG network is is individually analyzed by a relatively small group of other nodes for and they they analyze the the history of of the inputs funding that transaction they, they look for double spends and they enforce all the rules of of the protocol but 
it may only be, and each, each user can decide for themselves, but it may only be 20 different random nodes that are inspecting a single transaction. And, and those, those 20 nodes would be each individually asked, is this transaction valid? And they'd, the, they'd form a consensus. And if, if enough of them say that it is or that it isn't, then that's what the network believes and, and that transaction proceeds. Because of that, because you're, you're breaking the work into kind of transaction sized chunks instead of network sized chunks, you, you're able to, to have just a humongous number of transactions flowing through the network simultaneously. So whereas as a currency like Bitcoin, a, a blockchain proof of work protocol can, can achieve three transactions per second network wide, you know, Millix and, and the DAG is able to achieve 100,000 transa transactions per second network wide and the more people are participating on the network, the more nodes there are, the more that, that scales up even further, which is the, the complete opposite of, of the other projects we looked at and, and blockchains. So those projects, because they had kind of choke points of coordinators or validators, there was a, a, there was a bottleneck from that, and the bottleneck got worse if you added more validators or controllers in an attempt to scale up. It, was a, it appeared to be a, a, a real problem for scale. And, and so that, that's, thank you for bearing with me for that explanation. The, yeah, to answer really your question, the, uh, <laughs> sorry I didn't answer your question. The, the answer <laughs> to your question, how to, how to get started, is um, you, you either, you, you download the, the Millix client from millix.org and, and it can run on a, on a pretty low power computer. And mm -hmm. when you're running that, that software, you're eligible to get transaction fees that are kind of passing through your node or that your node is, is working on validating. It's a, it's a proxy activity that, that actually earns you the transaction fee. And um, unlike proof of work, the, the work doesn't get more difficult. And as a result of that, the hardware doesn't become more obsolete. So, you know, a, a $200 laptop uh, it, that can earn fees today and will still be earning fees 10 years from now. Got it. So pretty, you know, pretty low bar to entry into participating in the network. And, um, you know, that's interesting to, I think, a lot of people who, you know, uh, there are people out there that want to, you know, trade different uh, crypto assets, and there are other people that want to participate, and some that want to do both. Um, it, it sounds like there's a really um, low barrier to entry for anybody that wants to participate in the network by in the network infrastructure itself. And you know, you said something that really got my attention about how you know, as the number of nodes increases in the Millix network, it actually gets faster, which is just sort of counterintuitive to all the other, you know, crypto asset technologies that we've known to date, which to, as you pointed out, you know, because of choke points or because of scaling issues, you know, they just, the, 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 you know, the, the bigger the network effect, the, the harder it gets for those networks to scale, it seems, right? Um, whereas it, the complete opposite seems to be in place uh, with Millix, right? The more the more nodes, uh, the faster and the more work that can be done, right across That's right. the network. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. So, um, you know, it's really fascinating. I mean, it, it's uh, you know what you know the what are some of the you know I think about this then and the scale and the throughput, and you know there over the years there have been a lot of talk about like oh you know there's going to be this internet of things and you know my toaster is going to charge somebody a, a fee to put a slice of bread in it or something and machines are going to be talking to machines and all this stuff and and i and i still think that'll all happen um is that what millix is trying to solve or you know what what will millix be useful for what problem you know does it you know, does it solve for you in sort of building, you know, the, you know, this ecosystem that you talked about at the beginning of our discussion? You know, I think, you know, what I think is happening here is that Millix is foundational for that ecosystem. So what is the ecosystem? Is it machines talking to machines? 
or is this uh, you know a people ecosystem? Tell me a little bit more about what your vision is there. Yeah, the 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 vision. Uh, first of all, um, my my perspective, the, the perspective that I have that kind of drives my personal behavior and, and my decisions is that um, uh, a man's a man's net worth is measured by the size of his contribution. It's it's that. And and you can you can kind of try to battle test that and and say, well, you know, so why why does somebody like Mark Zuckerberg deserve to be as rich as he is? What did he right? How, how do you justify his net worth if you're using contribution as the explanation for having that net worth? Well, Mark Zuckerberg facilitated a trillion conversations between family and friends. That's it. That's it. I mean, and, and there's a measurement to what that contribution is worth. It's worth billions of dollars. And, and he deserves to be the beneficiary of that. In, for myself, I, I thought that my, I, this is what I thought my best contribution could be. I, I thought that artificial intelligence and automation is, is going to replace every single job on the planet, full stop, every job. And the only unknown is the timeline that that happens on. But it's happening already. It's, it's, it's not like a projection of something that might happen. It's just how fast is it going to happen. And OK, then, then I thought that the, the kind of the reaction to that reality was going to be the governments around the world, and you know, everyone seems, everyone kind of starts, at least we probably start with a, a US centric perspective on that, but it's every government in the world that's gonna try to have to figure this out. And, and I, I didn't have reason to believe that um, A, they, were, they would be able to, and B, that whatever they tried wouldn't either backfire or have unintended consequences. And whether that's inflation or, um, you know, there's mental illness that comes as a result of, of not feeling valued by community because your work has, has disappeared. It's a, it's a, that was the problem that I wanted to solve. So, so then my contribution, I thought, tactically speaking, would be that I would allow everyone on planet Earth the ability to earn a living by doing the activities that they're already doing and doing for free and that they enjoy doing. And I think, I think the internet hasn't, hasn't allowed that to be possible yet, but I think, it, I think when we start talking about these things that, that we're building, I think it's, it's going to be a real possibility and I think it's going to, I think it's going to help a lot of people. Yeah, so if I'm hearing you correctly, then what you're saying is, you know, right now somebody posts a picture, you know, and, and it gets a lot of likes. Um, the only person that pays is, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, right? Because they posted it on Instagram or Facebook and it got a lot of reaction and got forwarded, you know, whatever, whatever, right? It got a lot of, you know, there was a lot of engagement. So in 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 this millex based ecosystem that person posts a picture it gets lots of likes it gets forwarded and shared and all those great things they're earning <laughs> on the picture that they took and posted right they're, yeah yeah you know it's kind of flipping you flip the script completely right you've taken yeah. you know all the uh, you know all the earning potential you know for the activity that you know joe or sally uh is doing on the internet uh, is is accruing to them instead of the platform owners. Yeah, and maybe let's let's take a a step back. So that that was that was one of the core initial um, kind of pieces of the ecosystem in my mind was monetizing social media exclusively to the benefit of the the users of social media as opposed to the platform, right? Mm-hmm. So, so as you said, right now, basically the entire global population provides free content to, to the platform 
which then monetizes it, and, and the platform is the sole beneficiary of all the money that comes in from the advertisers. And the only thing that the, that the users get in return, basically, is a violation of their privacy. That's, that's the thanks that they get. But if, if we take just half a step back, um, I, the, the first aspect of this ecosystem that, that people, I think, will see and can use right now is the Tangled browser. Uh, Tangled.com has, has a number of, of products that you can see on there, but the browser is the first one. And, and the browser, it's, it's like any other uh, internet browser with, with, a couple, uh, with a couple key exceptions. One is that um, the, the Tangled browser extends the Millix ecosystem to every page that anyone goes to on the internet. So there's, there's advertisements that appear not within the page, so it's not disrupting the, the content of the internet, but it's, it's, you know, it's in the header of the browser. And this is a decentralized advertising platform that anyone who's running the browser can create their own ad campaigns. There's no approval process for the ads, right? There's, there's no um, morality police like some of, like, like the monopolies have now that determines what ads are allowed or not allowed, it's, it's peer to peer. It's decentralized and peer to peer. And the, the interesting part about it is when the advertiser spends money on their ad campaign, their money goes directly to the people who are viewing the ad, right? It's a direct payment from advertiser to consumer and that payment is not going through any intermediaries or brokers. It's a payment directly from them, from the advertiser to the consumer on the Millix network. And the money is, is available to the consumer immediately. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. The other exception to the browser is that the browser, anyone who's watching this video, whatever browser they're using, that browser is phoning home to the mothership whether it's phoning home to Google or Apple or any other project, there's an incentive for when the, the producer of the browser, the platform that built the browser, is the recipient of the ad revenue. The problem with that is they're incentivized to optimize for the advertiser targeting. You know, this person is, is this demographic and is most likely to react to your ad, so we're going to put your ad in front of that user. That doesn't happen without tiptoeing around or squashing people's privacy. All your, all your behavior online is being sent back on the existing platforms to, the, to the, the data centers of the big companies who are then using that data to assist advertisers to target you. So they're, they're monetizing your behavior and data, and, and none of that exists on the Tangle browser, there is no, there's no place for it to phone home. It's open source. You can, you can review the code and, and verify what I'm saying. But the only, the only thing that that is used to target an ad from the consumer to the to the advertiser is the geographic location, which is based on the IP address, which everyone has to have and, and is public to be on the internet. So that's not much of a violation and the language that the, the consumers indicated that they speak. That's, that's the targeting that the advertisers have available to them. Okay, I see. So, yeah, it sounds, um, I mean, it sounds really revolutionary in a way. I mean, so you're talking about Tangled, which is this browser, if, I'm, uh, if I remember correctly, it's, it, it's based on, built based on Chrome. So you took the Chrome code base and extended it. Is that right? And Only the open source aspect of Chrome called Chromium, which doesn't involve, okay. it doesn't include any of the features, any of the Google specific features. It's just a browser. Okay. So it's, it's the stripped down, you know, kind of the core element of, of what makes a browser function and then yeah. extended that to include the Millix. Um, you know, it, it's all powered by Millix, I guess you could say, right. Uh, the underlying sort of economy Tangled is going to bring to somebody is based on Millix. And so one thing that I noticed, you know, that you, you see right away when you open up, um, you know, and you go to tangled.com, you see this tagline, it says, pay me internet, right? So it's it's almost like it's quite literal, 
right? So everything that you do online that you would normally do anyway, you're liking pictures, you're, you're, you're you know, sharing videos and you're posting stuff yourself, all these, or, or you read an advertisement as you discussed, uh, you know, any of those things that you normally do day to day, um, create and generate revenue directly to your Millix, you know, wallet that's baked into the, into the tangled browser. Right. And, um, yeah, it's just it creates that economy where there's no intermediary that uh, no you don't have to wait thirty days to get paid. There's nobody taking a cut um, along the way. There's no middleman. There's no platform to be paid. Um, you're just you know doing the things you would normally do and getting paid for for doing those things. And so that's interesting, right? But then it becomes you know. So you're just getting paid for like surfing the internet and doing stuff, right? Okay, great. But so, you know, the enterprising individuals will see, I think, immediately that there's a huge opportunity here, right? And you can, you know, people that have large followings or they want to build a large following, they can quickly realize and that they can do that on this platform and not get demonetized, not get deplatformed. Um, yeah, you're you're yeah. talking about tangled social, the, the social media mm. aspect. Right. Yeah. Yeah, maybe yeah, this is a great segue from the browser to the sort of the social network aspect of of tangled. Maybe you could give uh, give a little bit of an overview on that aspect. Yeah, so um tang tangled social um is is kind of a reinspection of of social media, of, of what social media is. And I think, I've, I think I've probably pretty well described my opinion of the current state. And Tangled Social is, is meant to, um, well, let me tell you what it doesn't do. T Tangled Social has no algorithm. There's, there's no algorithm and there's no filter. The, there's, there's, no, um, there's no board of, of moderators back at headquarters that are determining which opinion is acceptable to show other people. There's no uh, moral, moral authority or arbiters of truth. If, if you... So the, the only the, here, this is the content policy. You, you go to any social social media network now and read their content policy. And it's um, one is it's ambiguous. But two, regardless of what they say it is, it's going to be interpreted by an intern whose whose job is to decide whether something's OK to be said or not. And so the content policy of Tangle Social is what is permissible under U.S. law. That's it. It's that's it. Hmm. So, and and it, and it it's only that because at the moment we all have to live in a jurisdiction, and and living in that jurisdiction makes you subject to the laws of the jurisdiction and incarceration and fines and court appearances and, and all those things. And I'm, I'm in the United States, so I can't break U.S. law. If, if someone is in um, a country where it's illegal to make a joke about the leader of that country, that's not going to get taken down. Now, we might get blocked permanently from that country, and we have solutions for that too that we're building, but we're we're not gonna we're not gonna operate on bended knee to try to exist everywhere in the world. We're gonna we're gonna exist on the internet, and if it's worth using, people will find a way to use it, even if their their local government has determined that it doesn't fit their what's acceptable, and they're gonna block us. And so that's the content policy. The, the, idea, the idea of Tangle Social is that all the content that's provided by the user base has value, and the, the person that provided that content is the beneficiary of that value exclusively. The, the platform itself doesn't try to make any money from 
the engagement, the eyeballs, the, the user data, it doesn't even store the data. And it doesn't matter whether you, you post a, a, a cat meme that gets a lot of engagement, or if you comment on a post and that comment gets a lot of engagement, the, the, they're both content creators and they're both gonna get paid for the level of engagement that they, that they produce. Mm -hmm. So the, how does the rest of Tangled work? There's, there's also the concept, well not concept, there's the uh, component tree that's built into Tangled browser that handles you know, how search works. And you've talked a little bit about advertising as well. Maybe you could spend some time, you know, describing, you know, if I want to run an ad, I'm just, you know, I, for whatever reason, for a business or a personal thing, um, how, how will those, how, how does search and how does advertising work? And, you know, what are, what are the touch points between the two? Yeah, I think it's, it's important to, to note that um, there's, there's kind of two vectors of, of ways to earn that, you know, when we're talking about the tangled social and your creativity being a, a vector of, of, of income, the other vector is the computing power of your laptop, right? That is idle most of the time. And if somebody has the tangled browser installed on their device, then they can, they can opt to use the computing power of that device to do work that the network considers to be valuable. And, and you touched on one of the examples, which is Tangled Search. Tangled Search is, um, to the best of my knowledge, is, is the first decentralized peer-to-peer -peer search engine ever, which means that, and again, there's no algorithm, right? So it's, it's not up to a, a monopoly to determine when you do a search for something, what they think the top result is. That's, f that's for the, the individual user of, of the search engine to decide for themselves, which I'll get, I'll get to in a minute. So if, if you're running the Tangled browser, you've installed it on your device, then you can tell the device I want to participate as a, as a node in this decentralized peer-to-peer -peer search engine. And what that means is your, your device is in the background. Your device is going to be crawling internet pages at whatever pace your bandwidth or your computer can handle and, and storing data from pages on the internet locally on your machine. What, however much data your machine can handle, you set that up. It could be a gigabyte. It could be a petabyte. What happens is when a user of, of Tangle Search puts in, a, puts in a search for cat food, whatever, that search request is propagated out to all the other nodes on the network of the Tangled network in the same way that, that transaction data is propagated out on the Millix network. And anyone who's running the, the search engine aspect of, of Tangled <clears throat> in their browser, we'll see that there's a request for a search for cat food. And they do, a, a, they do a quick scan, the system does a quick scan on their local database and says, either I have something or I don't that matches that, that search. And if I have it, I'm gonna provide it back to the, the person that requested that, that performed the search. So the person that performed the search is in very quickly, by the way, the, the response time is, is good enough they're gonna get a response from hundreds or thousands or more nodes, tangled nodes on the network, and then their, their local machine is gonna sort those, res those results in whatever way that, that user thinks is important to them. It could be based on a, a word density relevancy, it could be on the, the time, the, the most recent um, pages are content first, it could be on the authority of the page based on, on some other algorithms that are, that are local to that machine. But the point is that you're taking, you're, it's, it's search, is there a more powerful tool on the internet to manipulate or control than information and isn't search the, the, the way that information is, is provided? You're, you're taking the monopoly and the centralization of search now and you're destroying it. 
and it uses ads from the Tangled Ad Network. So again, advertisers are participating, consumers are getting paid. And in the case, the, the economics of search is that if, if I send out this, this search request for cat food and a thousand different Tangled nodes respond with, with some result, whichever one of the results that are, are presented to me on my local device, whichever one I select, that, that is declared the, the, the node that provided that result as the winner of the search. And the advertisers that are on the page, some of, some of their advertisement money is going to go pay the person that's running on their laptop, running Tangled, running the search node that had something interesting about cat food. How, you know, I hear a lot about like, you know, DuckDuckGo and, you know, the Brave browser. I mean, how, how is this different? Is it the decentralized nature? Do they actually have algorithms running behind the scene that is are determining things on your behalf? I mean, what, um, maybe, you know, can you offer up any contrast there? Well, I, I, like I said, I, I think that this, I, I don't, I haven't even heard a conversation about the potential of a decentralized peer to peer search. I, I know that, you know, one of, one of the companies you mentioned um, recently bought a search engine um, because they, they have they have traffic and they're losing that traffic to another search engine. So they, I, I assume they, they want to provide the service and, and keep the keep the eyeballs. But I think that it's um, a centralized, you know, data center heavy search activity. So what? Um... You know what, what? So what do people need at the end of the day to you know to participate in this ecosystem between the mil Milix as the the asset that kind of undergirds all the activity that's happening in the tangled, you know, tangled based browser based uh, economy, right? What 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 else do they need? What do they need exactly, you know, to get get involved? Yeah, the the Milix client that you would download from Milix.org. Is, is it's suitable for a consumer that wants to transact Millix and store their Millix and earn transaction fees from the network. It's suitable for that. It's also suitable for more hardcore developers that want to build a layer two application on top of the Millix network. It has the API mm -hmm. layer and, and everything that you need to, to build a layer two. I think most most people, all they need to do is, is download the Tangled browser from Tangle.com. And, and the Tangled browser, in addition to you know, kind of these, these features that we've already talked about, it's also running a, a full Millix node. Millix, Millix is built into the browser. So when, when you open the Tangled browser on, on the top, you see your Millix balance, you see how many peers you're connected to on the Millix network, and, and it's a live and active node on, on the Millix network. In addition to all those other things that either your computer can do in its idle time or you can do is either a pleasure or a, a, a way to earn income. Awesome, so, what, so what's, you know, this is all live and happening right now. I mean, somebody could go to tangle.com, download the browser, um, and get started as quickly as that, right? And participate in the in the ecosystem. What um, you know, which is really amazing and outstanding. What what's coming down the road? What does the future hold for um, th this project, if you will, or the ecosystem in general? Um, what, what's kind of next on the on the roadmap? Yeah, so Millix is live, and um, the, the Genesis transaction for Millix was January 20, 2020. So it's, it's, been, it's been live for a while, but we haven't made any noise about it. We haven't told anyone about it because we had to build some of the ecosystem that was the reason that we created Millix in the first place. So at this point, the, the Tangle browser is, is live and available. You can, you can earn transaction fees just by running the browser. You can earn payments from advertisers just by running the browser. And you can create and maintain 
your own ad campaigns. Any any business or entrepreneur could can set up their ads now and they'll show on other people's computers. The, the, the next thing at the time that we're filming this, the, the next thing that we're working on is the the search and the social media site, and, and those will be done in parallel to each other. So beyond that, I think that there are um, really interesting applications and use cases for the ability to store large amounts of data with every single transaction output. You know, data that is is signed by um, by the author or the creator or the, the copyright owner or, or whoever it is. So it's cryptographically signed. It's immutable. It's stored immutably, cannot be changed. And it can be transferred with pedigree. And, and that, that, you know, the, as soon as I said that, everyone listening to this, the first thing they thought of was, oh, NFTs, N right? NFTs, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, and, and they're right, you know. Um, NFTs are an application of that. But one of the things one of the things you mentioned before was you know if if you have a, a high scale micropayment protocol, then it opens the door to the Internet of Things. It could open the door to um, operating a, a factory floor, you know, operating a logistics system where each machine in the process is communicating to other nodes, Millix nodes, maybe even sending payments between nodes storing information about uh, serial numbers or product information, I think that could be interesting. I think that, that when people hear NFT, they, they think of JPEGs off, off the bat, but a non-fungible token just, just means that the data that's, that's being represented is theoretically one of one. It's, it's, a, it's a scarce asset of one that's encrypted and stored immutably and transferable. And so think, you know, in my mind, I, I think about what that means in terms of something like medical records, right? Where, where you, you could store your personal medical records in, in an encrypted protocol like, like Millix, and you could, you could forward that to a doctor but they can't forward it to another doctor unless you either allow them to or you then send it for them to, to that other doctor. And, you, and now, the ability to store data in, in a cryptographic protocol like Millix allows you to, to control your data, protect your privacy, and, and participate with more activities on the internet that require an identity like a an, a, a an indisputable identity like voting right so so that's that's the so data on the dag and the and the interesting use cases for that is we're going to be spending some time on that yeah i mean uh, you, you could kind of fix the world with uh, with this technology if it you know but we'll start small right and we'll just uh We'll fix uh, social media, you know, browsers, search, and all all things uh, intertwined into that ecosystem, and uh, see where it goes from there. Yeah, we'll we'll start we'll start small <laughs> by collectively in a decentralized way disrupting the top five market cap companies in the history of the right. planet. We'll just we'll start yeah, there. We'll just social search and ad right, platforms. Right. Yeah, and just touching, you know, everybody with internet access. So somewhere on the order of, you know, six, seven billion people, potentially. So yeah, we'll start small, right? Yeah, and and it's important. I think it's important to note that. I I think it's important to note that that all the companies, or if you want them, want to call them competitors, they're 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 at a just a serious disadvantage regarding all the things we talked about. And, and their disadvantage is this. They, and th this, is a, this is the most mo normal mindset on the planet. And for whatever reason, I don't, I don't know why I don't have this mindset. But if you envision the companies that we're talking about who could try to do these things, 
they they aren't they they don't just have an incentive to produce a profit they have an obligation to produce a profit from from their shareholders none of the things that we talked about none of the activities none of the economy none of the transactions none of those things have have any I don't benefit from them, right? No one on our team benefits from them. We're just we're opening these these platforms to the world, and as as long as we can keep our doors open, everyone is free to to engage in these these tools, these systems as they see fit, and we don't have to have the overhead of a hundred thousand employees because we're using the computing resources of the network and we're using the the content created by the network, whether it's search or or social or or whatever. So, and if any of those companies or competitors changed their perspective and adopted this, this idea that, that quarterly earnings tend to lead to short-sighted decisions, which may not be the best decisions, if, if they start to play kind of the, the infinite game theory instead of the finite mm -hmm. game theory, the faster they do that, I, I welcome it, right? If, if if somebody takes these ideas and does it better than we do, more power to them, right? The objective is, is realized. Yeah, but how could any of those companies do it without, at the same time, putting themselves out of business? Yeah, I don't think they can. Right? I, I don't think they can. Yeah. And, and I mentioned kind of our recognition that, that countries could, could shut us down. I think that, that when you think about kind of the rational response of a, of a monopoly, a search monopoly or an ad platform monopoly, um, it, it's going to be hard for them to compete with us because it's asymmetric. The, the, more, the more participants we have that are getting paid to participate, the more computing power we have. For them to equal that, they have to, in a centralized way, spend billions of dollars to buy millions of more servers and locate them in a central place and they have to convince their shareholders that it's a good idea and that there's going to be an ROI. And uh, I, I don't think that they can do that. I, I, I don't even think that they would be interested in trying to do that. And I think to, to the extent that we provide disruption to them or a, a problem for their business model, I think it's probably going to end up with them lobbying politicians to create laws that prevent free expression and the absence of centralized monopolies controlling your experience on the internet, when in reality, our approach is pay me, internet. That's it, just that. Perfect, yeah. Great way to kind of put an exclamation mark on, on the whole discussion, I think, Bryce. I mean, that's what it's all about. This is, you know, at the end of the day, you know, pay me, internet is, Flipping the script and making it about, you know, getting that value accruing to the person who's creating it, right? Instead of all of the people in between uh, the producer and the consumer, right? And um, that's where it starts, I think, with, for now, with, uh, you know, the, the Millix and the Tangled story combined uh, in this ecosystem. And we'll see where, you know, where the future takes us. But I think it's a pretty big, uh, very ambitious you know, project. And, um, you know, it's, it's going to, I think, make a lot of waves and uh, I'm excited about where, where, where this will go. So thank you so much for your time. Hey, thanks, Rick. All right. Well, that wraps up our conversation with Bryce Givens. Uh, we plan to do more of these kinds of conversations as things uh, emerge and evolve over time and uh, come back to present and share with all of you kind of more thoughts and, and um, deep dives into the technology. Uh, if you're curious and you want to learn more, uh, maybe there was something talked about during, during that uh, one hour session, a conversation that you want to learn more about, you, there are a few places you can go. Um, number one, you could go to millix.org if you want to learn uh, more about the Millix protocol and uh, all the underlying tech papers are there on the website. You can download the full client to your to your local machine, desktop, laptop, what have you. Um, so that's the Millix protocol. You could also go to tangled.com and there you can you know watch 
some brief, uh, I, I would call them entertaining, uh, uh, video snippets for each of the four areas of Tangled, which are, you know, browser, search, um, advertising, and, and social. Um, you can also read uh, for each one of those four uh, components of Tangled, you can also read the tech paper behind it. And it's all, it's right there on the homepage, tangled.com. You can find it all right there. And um, yeah, that's, that's how, you know, it, so if you want to learn more, if you want to download the browser, that's where you go for tangled.com. And I already mentioned uh, millix.org for the underlying millix protocol. Um, and I think that just about covers it. So uh, I look forward to our future conversations and, um, for now, we'll sign off. Thanks, everyone.